Seeking the lost, yes, kindly entreating Wanderers on the mountain astray Come unto me, his message repeating Words of the Master speaking today Going afar, going afar upon the mountain, upon the mountain, bringing the one, bringing the wonder back again, back again, into the fold, into the fold of my redeemer, of my redeemer, Jesus the Lamb, Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain, for sinners slain, seeking the lost and pointing to Jesus, souls that are weak and hearts that are sore, leading them forth in ways of salvation, showing the path to life evermore. Going afar, going afar upon the mountain, upon the mountain, bringing the one, bringing the wonder back again, back again, into the fold, into the fold of my redeemed of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb, Jesus the Lamb, for sinners slain, for sinners slain. Thus I would go on missions of mercy, following Christ from day unto day, cheering the faint and raising the fallen, pointing the lost to Jesus the way. Going afar, going afar upon the mountain, upon the mountain, bringing the one, bringing the wonder back again, back again, into the fold, into the fold of my redeemer, of my redeemer, Jesus the Lamb, Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain, for sinners slain. Graham's just finished the series of lectures or, or, or uh, discussions or um, talks on the book of Judges. That's been concluded last Tuesday. And I don't know what impression has been made on those who sat through those lectures and, and heard what Graham had to say. seems to me that the predominant impression that must have been made and the overwhelming uh, sight that was brought before your eyes was that of a nation racked with uh, uh, unrest, injustice, turmoil, and that these were wild and cruel days. The reasons given, of course, in the book itself, because uh, four times in the last five chapters you were told there was no king in Israel. Each man did that which was right in his own eyes. And uh, in that third verse of the last chapter there's a very graphic cry raised by the remaining uh, 11 tribes after a devastating assault had been made upon the tribe of Benjamin a cry that shot through with anguish and pain because of what had happened because of what they've done to their brethren the 11 tribes met together afterwards at Bethel and they said O Lord God of Israel why has it come to pass in Israel that today there should be one tribe lacking in Israel. Now you can't read that story that covers the last three chapters and it seems to me that the fact that it does cover three chapters is an indication of the importance of that event. But you can't read those three chapters uh, without feeling the overwhelming sense of loss and grief and anguish experienced by those remaining 11 tribes. And I believe that's emphasized by the way in which the name Israel occurs three times in that statement. O oh Lord, the God of Israel, why has it come to pass in Israel that today there should be one tribe lacking in Israel? That, that repetition seems to convey the thought that Israel was meant to be a unity of 12 tribes bound together with ties of brotherhood and love. Uh, each descended from Father Jacob, each having its stone in the breastplate of the high priest carried before God into the tabernacle, uh, each one with his appointed place uh, in, in the arrangement around the tabernacle when the tabernacle was, was erected, uh, each one blessed first of all by Jacob and then later by Moses. And now one tribe, one entire tribe is absent. The circle has been broken and the unit has been lost. Now, 
The missing tribe was the tribe of Benjamin. And it seems to me that that's what made the agony all the more difficult to bear. Because after all, this was the tribe descended from the youngest son of Jacob known by that name. You may remember that Benjamin had been born uh, in the land of Canaan. In fact, the only one of the twelve sons of Jacob to be born in Canaan. The other eleven were all born in Mesopotamia. But in giving birth to Benjamin, Rachel, who was the only woman that Jacob ever really loved, died. And such was the sorrow at her passing that in dying she named the little baby Benoni, which means son of sorrow. But Jacob, recognizing that all that he had of Rachel was now to be found in this little baby, had renamed the child Benjamin, which means son of consolation. And in those early days, you discover that even the eleven brothers, though they did come from four different women, as a matter of fact, the eleven brothers really looked after that little baby, that little, that, that youngest brother of theirs. They took care of him. They felt a responsibility towards him. You read that in the story of, for example, the various journeys they made to the land of Egypt in order to get corn for their families. And indeed, in uh, Psalm 68, David actually calls him Little Benjamin. That's the the sense of affection that the uh, the other eleven tribes had for their younger brother, Little Benjamin. Later on still, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 21, when the prophet Samuel is sent to uh, to, to uh, to Saul, the son of Kish, who lived at Gibeah, uh, to tell him that God had chosen him to become the first king of Israel... Here is a man fully aware of the smallness, the insignificance of his tribe. He says, am I not a Benjaminite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And that's absolutely true. Because in comparison with the other eleven, the tribe of Benjamin was never really large. If you look, for example, at the beginning of the book of Numbers, and you discover, you, you look there to see how many fighting men there were in the various tribes, there were tribes with over 100,000 fighting men among them. And Benjamin, well, they never numbered any more than thirty-five to 40,000 altogether. It was never really large. Now, of course, when you come to study those three chapters, you see the reason for the absence of Benjamin. It's really a tragic story. I don't really think it's a story to be read aloud in public because it's so, so, so delicate and, 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 and so, so, so very special, uh, so, so particular, that you need to read it in the quietness of your home. But nevertheless, here were the men who came into conflict with the combined forces of, of, of the other eleven tribes over a very serious offense that had been committed by some of the men of Benjamin. So serious was that offense, such an affront was it to God and to the purity of God's nation, that God determined that it had to be punished at all costs. And uh, God sent out the other eleven tribes to fight against their brother. You read those last three chapters, they're very grim chapters indeed. It's a story of bestiality and brutality and callousness, putting it in, in a word. And again, it reveals the lawlessness of the times through which they were living. But you see, by their attitude, the rest of the men of Benjamin, in refusing to hand over the guilty men to be punished, became accomplices. They became parties to the offense. And that was something that could not be tolerated. So the order came, as I say, to the other remaining eleven tribes to march out against Benjamin. It was a terrible thing to have to do, of course. But the impurity had to be purged. Sin had to be punished. The evil of God's people had to be rooted out. And it wasn't an easy thing to do, I shall understand. If you read the story, you, you, you sense the distress, the overwhelming agony experienced by the others at the thought of fighting against little Benjamin, their brother, over whom they ought to have been exercising protection and care. Twice they sought the mind of God, hoping that in some way God would swerve away from his determination to punish Benjamin. But no... Judgment had to be meted out. And eventually, after a final terrible battle, there were three battles altogether, but after a final terrible battle, the tribe of Benjamin was all but exterminated by the overwhelming strength of the other eleven. 
400,000 men fought against 26,000. And of the 26,000, only 600 men remained alive. And they fled uh, northward. And they took refuge in the rock rimmon, which in Hebrew means the impregnable rock of the pomegranate. And for four months, those 600 survivors of the tribe were there, no doubt thinking all the time of the countless thousands of their brothers who had died, as it says, over against Gibeah, towards the sun rising. Besieged they were. Meanwhile, the rest of the tribes, well, for them it was a heartbreaking time. When the battle was over, they assembled at the tent of God in the tabernacle and they looked around to see who was present and who was absent. And little Benjamin was absent. And so deeply was that loss felt that these strong men wept as only strong men can weep. And the cry is raised, we're told. They raise the cry, Oh, Lord, the God of Israel, why is it come to pass in Israel that today there should be one tribe lacking in Israel? I see grief over absent ones. Sorrow because people are not where they ought to be. Well, of course, that's natural, isn't it? You're going to say we naturally grieve over the absence of, of loved ones, people who are not present, people who are not missing. Oh, you see it all through the Bible. You go back to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3. Don't you sense something of the same sorrow in the voice of God when after sensing that the fellowship between himself and Adam had been lost, walking in the garden in the cool of the evening, Adam didn't come forward to meet God as at other times, and you have the voice of God saying, Adam, where are you? Adam was in hiding, just like Benjamin. Adam was absent. If you come over to the New Testament, uh, it seems to me uh, uh, there's a tremendous cry in the words of Paul in Romans chapter 9 when he's been glorying in the fact that the gospel has been brought to the Gentiles. He's glad that the barrier has been broken down, but the heart of Israel is still hard. And Israel has rejected its Messiah, refused the Savior. And Paul says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I can wish myself accursed from the Christ, for my kinsmen according to the flesh, for Israel's sake. And he goes on to say, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. As I say, he's glad that the Gentiles have been brought in. But he says, I have unceasing sorrow, pain in my heart for Israel. Israel was missing. Israel was absent. By the way, it's interesting to notice that in Philippians chapter 3 verse 5, in giving his pedigree, this same man says, I am of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul was a Benjaminite. It's interesting. You read in the book of Judges, Israel lamenting the absence of Benjamin. And in the letter to the Romans, you have Benjamin's most illustrious son lamenting the absence of Israel. It's striking. Now, there's no question, as I say, that the other 11 tribes uh, loved Benjamin. If you read on from verse 3 of that 21st chapter, you'll read that it says that the 11 tribes had compassion on the men of Benjamin. And there's always this sense of love uh, for the absent ones, or there should be anyway. You get it in the case of Jonathan, uh, way back in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 20 uh, and verse 18, where Jonathan is speaking to David and talking about David going into hiding because Saul was about to kill him or seeking to kill him. And Jonathan says very pointedly, your place will be empty and you will be missed. Your place will be empty and you will be missed. Sorrow for absent ones. We'll come back to that in a minute or two. I say that because, you know, um, absentees didn't always arouse the emotion of sorrow. Other emotions were sometimes raised as well. For example, if you read the book of Judges chapter 5, you read the overwhelming scorn of Deborah as she speaks of the absentees at the time when the, the Canaanites had been defeated. And there's that glorious song of victory raised by Deborah. And she talks about the absentees. She's not afraid to mention them by name. She's not embarrassed about it. She says there were certain people who should have been there, but they weren't. They should have given help, but they didn't. 
For, for example, she says, Reuben, where was Reuben, she asks. Why, she answers the question. He was listening to the bleeding of his sheep in his sheep folds. Oh, he sent a promise to come, but he never fulfilled his promise. Why didn't he do it? And he, then again, uh, he wasn't the only stay at home. What about Gilead? Well, Gilead, she says, stayed on the safe side of the river Jordan. He stayed on the other side of the river. He didn't get involved in the battle at all. What about Dan? Well, Dan hid himself in his ships off the coast till he saw how the battle was going. And what about Asher? Well, Asher hid in the ravines and the gullies. He, too, was afraid to come to battle. Oh, yes, she said. You read it. You read the Song of Deborah. The battle was won, but no thanks to the absentees for that. And, you know... If you, 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 you can see how you can spiritualize this. I don't have, to, I don't have to, to spell this out, do I? I don't have to paint you a picture. We may, like Reuben, as believers in the Lord, send our promises of support and leave the promises unfulfilled. The battle will be won, but no credit to us. And if we're not there in the battle when the fight is at its hottest, don't expect to share the victory when it's won. If we fail to throw our weight in for God... He'll accomplish his purpose just the same, maybe not with our help, but certainly with somebody else's help. And we need to remember that fact. And by the way, if you think these were bad, there's somebody even worse than that. There's a very deceitful tribe mentioned in Judges chapter 8, and that's the tribe of uh, Ephraim. Oh, they, they were very cunning people, those Ephraimites. Uh, for example, when Gideon fought against the, uh, um, the Midianites, uh, and you, you, everybody knows that story of Gideon winning a battle with 300 men. You know, we, we, we studied that particular story. Fighting against the Midianites with all 300 men and gains a tremendous victory. When the victories won, the men of Ephraim come along and very indignantly want to know why they hadn't been sent for to help in the battle. Now, Gideon was a very tactful man, man a very diplomatic man. Uh, he didn't want to have an argument with the men of Ephraim uh, and, and thus spoil the atmosphere of the victory. So he pushed them off with some very flattering words. He says, well, you know, you're such tremendous fighters. We didn't really think it necessary to send for men of your caliber. He says, in effect, what have I been able to do in comparison with you? Those are his words. What have I been able to do in comparison with you? you. And we're told there that when he said this, their anger against him was abated, and they went home. Now, they tried that once too often. They tried it uh, with a man of a very different metal some time later in Judges chapter 12. They tried it on Jephthah. Different fellow, that man. They came along after Jephthah had won his victory against the Ammonites, and they said again, why didn't you send for us? Why didn't you call upon us to do battle with you? And he very pointedly uh, said to them, listen, I sent for you once before and you didn't come. I, I jeopardized my life fighting for you. And he, he was so angry that he and his men fell upon the men of Ephraim and they slew so many that the passage of the Jordan that day was filled with the bodies of the men of Ephraim and the river ran red with blood. It didn't pay that time, you see. They didn't get away with it. And from that point on, the men of Ephraim were branded as cowards. Read Psalms 78. For in Psalm 78, the psalmist says, the men of Ephraim, being armed with bows, turned back in the day of battle. And forever they were considered to be, oh, they were men of tremendous ability. They were men with great skilled bowmen. They could have accomplished so much. They could have done so much. But they didn't do it. They were not there when they were needed. You know, I think I've met some of the men of Ephraim in the church. Would you believe it? You know, when something, I mean, I've had that experience once or twice in my life, when something's been going off in the congregation, and everybody's supposedly known about it, and everything's been done, somebody's come along to the answer, well, I wasn't asked to do this, and I, no, listen, you're not there to be asked to do things. If our hearts were where they ought to be, if we have the feeling for the work of the Lord we ought to have, we should be volunteering. We shouldn't be waiting for somebody to come along and plead with us to get a job done. That wasn't the way of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. Here am I. Send me. Send me. We ought to be like that. 
course, let me not be altogether on the downbeat. Let's get on the upbeat for just a minute, on a happier note. You know, there does come a time, and we recognize this, when people are getting on in years, and they're not able to do what they once did for the Lord, and they have to take a back seat, so to speak. You've got an example of, the, of this in a lovely way in Second Samuel chapter 22, where the Philistines, when David was an old man, and it was thought that the Philistines had been suppressed forever, the Philistines gathered their forces together, they mustered their strength, and they fought against David one more time. And David, the old man, he must have been getting on for 70 at the time, decided to lead the battle once again. He went out to battle, and a Philistine who had a new sword, we are told, a new weapon, fought against David, almost overpowered him. The old man was almost beaten by a man who wouldn't have dared face him in his prime. Almost killed him. And one of David's officers saw the unequal struggle, and he sprang in, and he rescued the old king. When the battle was over, and the Philistines were defeated. His officers gathered around him lovingly and tenderly, and they said to him, Thou shalt not go up to battle with us any more, lest thou extinguish the light of Israel. What a lovely thought that is, isn't it? Thou shalt not go up to battle with us any more, lest thou extinguish the light of Israel. There are brothers and sisters in the church all over the world who have borne the heat and the burden of the day, and who ought really to be able to take a back seat while younger men come along and take over the responsibilities, take over the duties, and take up the sword, take up the battle. And that's what it ought to be. I wish somebody would come along to me and say, Thou shalt not go up to battle any more, lest thou extinguish the light of Israel. Because I'm sometimes feeling the heat and burden of the day. I can tell you, it's a lot more difficult for me to preach than it used to be. Uh, take my word for that. But... You know, but you can't think that these brethren are absent because of indifference or because of lack of zeal or enthusiasm or lack of concern. Young men, get where you ought to be. Be doing the things that God has equipped you to do. There are young men in this congregation who have tremendous talent, tremendous ability that's not being used for the Lord as it ought to be. But the older ones among us can't go on forever. We're going to have to lay down the sword someday. And it would delight my heart if I saw young men coming forward and assuming positions of responsibility, uh, responsibility, taking the work upon themselves so that the older ones can certainly sit back and perhaps be there in an advisory capacity. I won't say any more about that because I get emotional about it. But, well, let me, a final thought. Look around you today. Do you notice any absentees? Any brothers and sisters who used to be here and are no longer meeting with us? Are you as concerned as the eleven tribes were about the absence of Benjamin? Does their absence cause you sorrow? Do you really care? Do you really miss them? I don't know what your answer is. Are you going to say yes? Yes, yes. All down the line. Well then, what have you done about it? What are you doing about it? You know, let me be brutally frank here. I wouldn't be surprised if some people who have been members of this congregation for quite some time don't know who these absentees are because you've not been that much involved in the work of the church here. Have you ever told the absentees that they're missed? I met one of them on the street only two days ago. And I told him, oh, I simply said, look, I won't mention, mention his name. We miss you. Why don't you come back? I couldn't say any more than that. I didn't need to say any more than that. All I could do was to leave those words in his mind for his own spirit and for the Holy Spirit to work on them. And perhaps to bring him to a realization that he needs to be back in fellowship among his brethren. Doing that which the Lord has equipped him to do. Whose job is it? Is the preacher's job to go and tell these people? Don't you believe it? It's not the, the job of any particular individual. It's the responsibility of every member of the congregation. 
If you see some, somebody going astray, if you see somebody wandering off and being in danger of being lost, don't you feel you should have enough of the love of the Lord Jesus in your heart to say something to that person and to do something about it? Just say the word. And it may only take a word. You know, it's amazing what God can do with a word. Who hath despised the day of small things, the word says. God can use little things. He's done it in the past. It was only a look that rent Peter's heart the night he betrayed Jesus, that sent him out into the darkness of the night to weep lonely, bitter tears of repentance and regret. God can use little things. It can be, for example, the resemblance to, to a long dead mother's face that does it. Or the whisper of a children's hymn coming over the guilty years that lie between. Or the memory of a wonderful time of fellowship you had in, in days gone by. These are things that God can use. And if you will say the word, even say, Sister, brother, we love you and we miss you. You can't be expected to do more, but you've done what you can. And remember that restoration is always possible. Oh, yes. Benjamin was restored. You wouldn't have thought so. Saul, the Benjaminite, became the first king of Israel, remember, after this. Saul of Tarsus, the Benjaminite, became the great apostle Paul after this. So what's the lesson? Well, even after the tribe had been extinguished, God worked in a wonderful way to restore Benjamin. Because restoration is always possible, thanks to the grace of God. Brethren, keep working and keep praying for the absent ones. Oh, Lord, the God of Israel, why has it come to pass in Israel that today there should be one tribe lacking. Let's make the absentees understand that we want them back and we love them and there's a place for them here. Well, Since the love of God has shed priceless blessings on my head, I have made, I have made it, my own. it my own. I will hide it in my heart that it never may depart. It shall rule, it shall rule. There alone, there alone, the love of God, the love of God within the heart, within the heart, will kindly nest and warmth and part, and warmth and part. The soul will glow like Jesus in His tender mercy. If the heart is made His will is dwelling place, the love of God, the love of God, glows like a flame, glows like a flame through in this year. Through in this years it is the same. It is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose its glory till we see Him face to face. Since the Son of God came down with His love, our lives to crown He with us. He with us would remain. Would remain. Greater love there could not be. Jesus died for you and me in our hearts. In our hearts He would reign. He would reign. The love of God. The love of God within the heart. Within the heart. Will kindly kindliness and warmth and part. And warmth and part. The soul will glow like Jesus in His tender mercy. If the heart is made His dwelling place. Dwelling place, the love of God. The love of God goes like a flame. Goes like a flame. Through in this year. Through in this years, it is the same. It is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose its glory till we see Him face to face. He who gave his love to me, that I might from sin be free, bids me share, bids me share it, today. it today. As I love you, he has said, you must serve men in my stead. As you go, as you go on your way, on your way. the love of God, the love of God within the heart, within the heart, will kindly kindliness and warmth and part. And warmth and part, the soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy. If the heart is made his dwelling place.
place the love of God. The love of God goes like a flame. Goes like a flame through endless years. Through endless years, it is the same. It is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose its glory till we see Him face to face. While his love burns true and bright, we are walking in the light he has shown, he has shown us, the road. us the road. We his glory must reflect, lest our dimness and neglect keep some soul, keep some soul from, from, its God. God. from its God. The love of God, the love of God within the heart, within the heart. will kindly and warmth and part, and warmth and part the, the soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy if the heart is made his dwelling place. dwelling place the love of God the love of God goes like a flame goes like a flame through in this year through in this years it is the same it is the same the love of God will never fail nor lose its glory till we see him face to face The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie. In pastures green, He leadeth me. In pastures green, He leadeth me. The quiet waters by My soul he doth restore again And me to walk doth make Within the paths of righteousness Within the paths of righteousness, in for his own name's sake. Yea, though I walk in death's dark veil, yet will I fear none ill. For thou art with For thou art with me and thy rod, and staff me comfort still. My table thou hast furnished in presence of my foes. My head thou dost with oil anoint, my head thou dost with oil anoint, and my cup overflows. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me. And in God's house forevermore, and in God's house forevermore, my dwelling place shall be.